Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to the Mad Mum Looks. I'm Mahin and I'm here with my co hosts, Sheikh Amr Saeed and Sim. Today I want to welcome a good friend of mine to the show, Mark Crane, who's visiting us from Detroit. Mark uh, grew up in the Detroit area and he attended Northwestern University, afterwards, where he worked at Iman, the Inner City Muslim Action Network, and moveon.org, and then relocated to Detroit a few years ago. So, Mark, Jazakallah Khair for coming on the show, man. Welcome. Oh, yeah. Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum. It's an honor to have you here, man. Salam alaikum. It's a blessing to be here. You know, I, I know you're here for a wedding, and I just made you drive an hour through West Suburban traffic. You know, so Mark and I, we actually connected a few years ago because our wives are actually friends. And so through uh, them, uh, we, we met. And the first thing I noticed about Mark was... He's living in the Chicago, and you're living in Auburn Gresham neighborhood, right? It's like 87th and like Ashland area, exactly. kind of. Yep. You know, and I was like, I didn't, and I was like, I was a, I was a suburban kid. I was in this, you know, grew up in suburban. You're on the south side at the time. I was right? in Hyde Park, Hyde bro. Park. You know, Hyde Park's like a bubble. It is. That's you know? true. I was trying to give you a little more credit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, some street credit. You know, but uh, the one thing I noticed about Mark is like, he's always talking about Detroit, man. And then I know, you know, People used to call you the mayor of Detroit. And then I remember you coming to class at Iman and Obedullah would stop the class and stop. He's like, Senator Crane, welcome. So like this connection of Detroit was always like, and I'm from, I'm an outsider to Chicago and I'm never trying to leave unless I go to like Medina or something. But you were trying to, you're all, Detroit was always your goal. What's it about Detroit that like kept, had this connection for you? Subhanallah, that's a deep question, bro. There are a lot of layers there. Um, well, you know, I'll say, uh, you know, alhamdulillah, I really enjoyed my time in Chicago. This is a great city. It's a beautiful community here, mashallah. Um, and, you know, my wife is from here. My first son was born here. So Chicago is always, you know, sort of a second home for me. Um, but Detroit was my first home. You know, Detroit is, you know, born and raised. Um, and Detroit is a, you know, Detroit is a city that... Um, it, it cultivates a lot of pride in all of its residents. It's a city that's been beat down a lot on over the years. Uh, you know, a lot of us have a chip on our shoulder. You know, there's a big underdog mentality or spirit that kind of emerges out of Detroit. Uh, and it's a place that I personally always knew I wanted to, uh, you know, spend the rest of my life if possible. I came to Chicago for school and sort of stuck around for a few years afterwards, you know, um, wasn't my initial plan, but of course Allah is the best of planners. And so when I did have an opportunity to sort of take my work with me and move back to Detroit, you know, I jumped on that basically as soon as I could. Uh, but you know, everything about Detroit, I love, man, the, the city landscape itself, the beautiful city design, you know, mashallah, Chicago is very easy to get around. Y'all got a nice basic grid system here yeah. in, in Detroit. There's a little bit more design, a little bit more uh, intricacy to the way the city is set up. Um, but also, you know, the culture of the people, uh, you know, it's a manufacturer city. It's a city of makers, a city of builders, a city of small business people. Uh, you know, it's a city that really epitomized black political power in this country for a very long time. Um, you know, and it's a city that's also sort of a, a you know, a, a microcosm of the national tale of uh, white flight from urban America, of the way that white supremacy has shaped our cities and our suburbs and how they relate to each other. Uh, so it's a, there's a lot of complexity there. Um, but you know, in short, you know, at the most personal level, it, it's home. Okay. How many generations did your family go back in Detroit? Uh, and we go back three generations. I mean, you know, that's, that's, that's about, uh, the, the norm for a lot of black families in the North that, you know, came North as part of the great migration, mm -hmm. you know, so my, uh, several of my grandparents, you know, moved to Detroit immediately started working in auto factories, um, a lot of my extended family still works for Ford and GM, uh, uh, but folks closer to my family um, sort of branched off into other businesses along the way. So my grandfather uh, started uh, one of the first black locksmith shops in Detroit uh, close to 60 years ago now. Um, you know, that sustained our family for a long time. I grew up locksmith and going to work every day with my dad and grandfather and uncle. Um, you know, so so, yeah, we're we're well embedded in the city of Detroit. Okay, cool. cool. Mashallah, that, that answers the question, man. You have, um, you have a lot of heritage there, Mashallah, and a lot of ancestors. Um, one thing that, um, and I don't know if he was serious about this, about uh, you saying at a young age that you wanted to be a mayor, or or young people say young things. Yeah, yeah. but I I think that's an awesome that that's an awesome initiative, and it it shows uh, what type of mindset you have. You know, I'll you know what I'll say about that is. Uh, I always wanted to help my city, 
you know, and, and that's the, that's the baseline. There was a time when I made the calculation that the best way to help my city would be to attain the most important political position in the city, which is the mayoralty. Um, I can't say that I hold that same perspective anymore. I think I've seen a bit more, I've grown a bit more, and I've seen the number of ways that people from all different types of positions, whether it's in the business world or the philanthropic world or whatnot, the community organizing level, can make really deep impacts on a place. Um, you know, I, I think I had somehow convinced myself when I was younger that the the most efficient path to change was through that particular political office. And I'm not so sure that I believe that anymore. But at the core of it, uh, my goal has always been to give something back to a city that I feel like gave me an incredible upbringing. Mashallah, when did these, when did it, when did this start this, this need to, uh, for progress and, and, you know, being proactive, uh, towards your, uh, I mean, a lot of people do, they just normally are inclined to accept their surroundings and yeah. they don't feel like they can change anything. How, how, why was it different for you? And can you elaborate on that? Oh, man. I don't know if I can elaborate on that. Sorry, I hope we're not intimidating. No, you're not intimidating, man. <laughs> Too you many guys, questions. These are great interv- <laughs> interviewers here. Um, a, a lot of it, uh, man, great question. You know, I would say that a lot of it probably started when I was young. When I first, when I was about 10 or 11 years old, I started going to, a, I was living on, on the east side of Detroit. First of all, I'm from Detroit, Detroit. So a lot of people say, oh, what part of Detroit? And what they mean you, is, what suburb are you from? Yeah, you can or blue. Yeah, I'm Bloomfield. from the west side, grew yeah. up on the east side, yeah. Detroit. So Inshallah. when I was about 10 or 11, though, alhamdulillah, I got a chance to go to a school that was um, one of the best schools in the state. And it was a private, independent school about 45 minutes outside of the city. And uh, I went there for seven years. My parents, for seven years, drove me 45 minutes each way. They'd drop me off. They'd go back to work downtown or back somewhere in the city. My dad was a serviceman, so jobs were everywhere. But, uh, you know, my parents made a tremendous sacrifice to get me to go to that school. Um, it's the same school, high school that Mitt Romney graduated from, actually. Wow. And uh, But when I started going at the age of 10, it was a real wake-up call because I showed up. And at in the high school level, it's a very diverse place. They pride themselves on that. They have a lot of international students. They have a lot of students from Detroit and as well as the surrounding suburbs. At the middle school level, it's more. It was more so a day school for the rich students who lived around it. This was in you know one of the the second or third wealthiest uh, county in America, Oakland County, Michigan. Um, at least at that time, the mid nineties, uh, and um, I showed up one of basically three black kids in a class of 54, the only one actually from Detroit itself. And all of a sudden, everybody wanted to challenge me to play basketball. <laughs> People wanted to ask me if I was a rapper. Like, just really, really ridiculous things, right? Wow. You know, I'm a 10-year-old, I'm an 11-year-old, right? And... But it was a, it was a, you know, it was a real wake up call. And so basically, you know, and I can't tell you how many times I was called the N word between sixth and eighth grade, just on that little middle school campus. So hmm. it was a wake up call for me. It was a very early introduction to, uh, you know, uh, racism 101 and systemic racism. Um, and also seeing the stark differences between the elementary school, public DP at Detroit Public School Elementary School I had just come from compared to the resources and the wealth that these students had. Um, so that was the, the beginning, I think, of a very long sort of awakening. Um, you had mentioned one of your influences was Malcolm X. And uh, a lot of community builders that we've met on our show and whatnot have were, were inspired by Malcolm X um, to a great part in their life. What, what do you think... Uh, in what way did Malcolm X inspire you? Or what exactly, in terms of stra- strategically, I mean, a lot of people get inspired by certain heroes and whatnot, but were you able to take some practical strategies from his movement and how he mobilized African Americans and try to use that in, in what you're trying to do? Um, that's a great question. You know, for me, uh, Malcolm X, Brahim Allah was a very, Malcolm X probably changed my life at least two times, maybe three. And 
the first was when I was in high school and maybe either sophomore or junior year first read the autobiography of Malcolm X. And at the time it, 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 it really made me rethink. Um, it made me rethink the way in which we socialized. It made me rethink uh, social norms. It made me rethink um, the concept of community and what it meant to build brotherhood and sisterhood and how to sustain it. Um, and so, you know, I read that and then, you know, all of a sudden was the person who, you know, would stop people mid conversation if they used the wrong word, right? Or my friends casually hanging out, use a derogatory term, I'd stop them mid sentence, right? Or I was the guy, and this is pre Islam for me, I'm, you know, I was the guy telling everybody that, you know, there should be no drinking or smoking or right. And I didn't really connect any of this to Malcolm's practice of Islam necessarily. For me, it was about this example that this black man was setting for the way the black community could improve itself. Um, and I was a Presbyterian at the time. And how old were you at this time? And this is high school. So this is, Mashallah. I think I first read it when I was 14. Mashallah. And, and then in college, uh, I reconnected with Malcolm X again. I, well, I read the autobiography again as a freshman, part of class, more academic approach to it. But I had a good buddy of mine, a brother who ultimately basically gave me Shahada, who was also a real fan sort of self-ascribed student of Malcolm X. And, you know, so we would, you know, just just go to town, listening to lectures, dissecting them, you know, reading whatever we could about them, always engaged in conversation. And I remember maybe this is maybe about a year before I actually became Muslim. He and I were just like riding through Evanston, Illinois one time. And he said, see, man, this is what, this is what Brother Malcolm would have wanted a Pakistani Muslim and a one day black Muslim riding together. <laughs> and I just kind of like laughed it off. He said one day black Muslim, ha, ha, ha. you know, what's this guy talking wow. about? And, and, uh, and it was actually a, several months after that, before we actually had our next real sort of full length conversation about faith that really started the process of me becoming Muslim. But, um, but suffice it to say, you know, at, at multiple key sort of stages in my life, Malcolm's narrative has been there. Um, and, you know, I think it, it boils down to him being, uh, number one, the the epitome of someone who allowed faith to transform his life, uh, someone who was always seeking, you know, even when, you know, it could be said that he didn't have the proper key, that it could not be said that he wasn't a truth seeker and that he wasn't committed to what he understood to be the truth. Um, but then also someone who was just a political savant, you know. Malcolm X was saying things 50 years ago about police brutality and about white supremacy that, you know, would be would be the most relevant speech anybody could give today. Uh, you know, and, and so th the wisdom that he had when it came to politics and when it, it was just so prescient. Um, so, yeah. Mom, Mark, if if I could share with you guys what Malcolm X really changed for me, please. It was that he always challenged the narrative, right? He challenged the narrative that the media, that the TV, newspapers, the establishment, right? The narrative that they're portraying, he's challenging that. He's saying that, why are we discussing problems within the boundaries that they've set for us? We should be challenging the narrative itself that we should be the ones who are setting the narrative, right? Yeah. Why are we working within the, you know, like on a basketball court, there, there's boundaries, right? Yeah. Why are we just playing their, their game? Yeah. We should be the ones who are proactive. And when we want change, you can't be playing by the rules, meaning uh, the rules that the establishment has set forth for you. Yeah, which was uh, foundation well, is already flawed. Yeah. Yeah. Which where you're set up to lose. Right. Yeah. And I felt like, those goals that he set or those lessons that he taught back then are more applicable to Muslims now than ever because the current situation that Muslims are in right now, that, that we are continually, continually condemning um, terrorist actions. We're, we're always playing by what whatever the media wants us to say, right? Yeah. But then we end up, still end up losing because no one buys it because they say that we're not sincere, we're... we're um, we're still, we're, we're hiding something or we're not, 
that uh, that the extremists are the ones who are actually practicing the true religion and that yeah. we're the ones who aren't. So these these are the things that that I feel like we as a community could learn from Man, that's, Brother Malcolm. That's an amazing thing to learn. One thing that I, that I can mention is, um, and I love seeing this every single time when somebody uh, enters a fold of Islam, is uh, you always see the trends or the the same exact routine that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, creates certain avenues and that makes the Islam easier for the person, right? Like you you read from Malcolm X and you were telling people not to whatever it be using negative language or foul language and you 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 had a certain uh, 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 nobility with you and you wanted people to understand that nobility, right? And you wouldn't drink like you were saying and you didn't you didn't like it and you were stopping people from doing that or you disliked that for people that were close to you and that just paves the way for islam and that's allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doing that it's so amazing that's the way allah subhanahu wa ta'ala favors people and then when you come into the fold of islam that change doesn't stop because your life from before is now completely different and you that and it becomes a contagious type of positive uh, changing force right Inshallah. and i always love seeing that you know when brothers they come into or sisters they come into the fold of islam not only do they change their uh, their their way of life and now they want to change their surroundings right and uh, and i think and, and this is i think a majority of people's weaknesses is that we shouldn't be satisfied um, and be settlers you know we always have to be uh, changing things around us you know, and I, and I always find that so, um, it's so intriguing to me how that it's always like clockwork that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala constantly gives us those signs, you know, and uh, he paves the way for us, you know. Alhamdulillah. Mark, so at Northwestern, you pledged to Alpha Phi Alpha, which is an African-American fraternity. And I guess one of the brothers said, quote, if I had been living the way I was supposed to, all you brothers would be Muslim by now. <laughs> so was that brother Muslim? Or like, what was the story there? He was. Where are you getting this background from? Where you... <laughs> I'm reading it off an article your wife wrote Is that right? right now. <laughs> but I, I was reading it earlier. But what I was, I was telling these guys earlier this week, the epiphany I had is, so right now what we got, we got Trump. Uh, who I'm voting for, by the way. Okay. And um, Hillary. You know, same old, you know, I, I don't change. Okay. I'm still a sellout. <laughs> you know, but. Uh, He's kidding. I'm proud of it. <laughs> we, we, we I'm got, proud of it. Uh-oh. We got Trump, Islamophobia, all this stuff, right? Uh-huh. And there's two angles here. The immigrant Muslims are like, oh man, I gotta go to Canada or I gotta go to England. I gotta get out of here. Uh-huh. But then I, never, I don't hear that from the African American Muslim community. And on the other, and, and the other thing I thought about was when I read that quote was, the immigrant Muslim community who have come over here, they feel like Islam, to be honest, frankly, is like a shackle. Whereas they, that quote tells me that African Americans feel like Islam is a liberating force. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, can you talk to us about that mentality? Like, hey, because like, I'm sure you're not trying to go to Canada, right? <laughs> I mean, we live pretty close, but no, I don't have any particular interest. I'll have to, you know... For political reasons, disavow myself of the generalities you just made. But no, 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 no. You know, I, I. That's a really interesting point. You know, I'll say a couple of things. I, one will be a little bit more tangential than the other. Um, one of the things that I'll say about the work that we're doing in Detroit with with uh, with Dream of Detroit, which maybe we'll circle back to a bit more later, sure. is that. And this was a project that was started just before I got back to Detroit. It's a community building initiative that we've got going there, focused on a particular neighborhood. One of the things that excited me about it early on was seeing that it was a um, a sincere sort of partnership between the Black Muslim community and the Pakistani Muslim community in the area, um, in the sense that folks were uh, coming together in a really equitable way, um, both with you know, uh, you know both sides putting in sweat equity, both sides putting in capital, both sides uh, committed to this vision of, of rebuilding this neighborhood. And, um, you know, I think unfortunately we don't see, uh, you know, we don't see the sort of collaboration across ethnic groups in the Muslim community the way that we should. So that was something that always inspired me about Dream. Now, of course, you know, uh, every sort of segment of our community comes with its own history and Perhaps some of that history is is, uh, is actually real baggage, depending on what it is. Um, so folks interpret modern events, you know, differently. Uh, I do think that there is a um, 
there's a there's a there's a difference in the way in which black people have historically conceived our citizenship in this country, which is, uh, you know, to, we are sort of in this country but not of it, if you will, um, and you know what I mean by that is, uh, sure, you know I can, you know, my my family, I could show you my family tree, and we can trace it back all these six generations to when slave master raped my great 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 grandmother, and it's and is the reason that half my family is light skinned today, right? Like I can I can tell you all that history, right? And so there, you know, there is a clear lineage of the contributions that my family has made to this country. And and I can claim that as 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 reason for me to to declare my Americanness or the privileges that come with being an American citizen, right? Uh, you know, we've we've invested in this thing that you you can't take that from us. At the same time, that history is one of sort of never ending oppression. So you know, the desire is actually not there to to to, to claim you know, without qualification, I'm a proud American, because why should I be when, you know, when the history is tied into displacement of my family in South Dakota, you know, uh, basically rounding us up onto a tiny reservation, multiple massacres in the history of that reservation, uh, as well as, you know, forced labor and sexual assault in the South. So, you know, there's a, you know, and, and that's not a dissimilar history to what a lot of Black Americans have faced in this country, um, or you know, people who are mixed. I you know reference some of my Native American heritage there. So uh, you know that is obviously a different story than someone who comes here with a particular conception of the American dream, and you know is uh, um, you know maybe escaping uh, abject poverty wherever they are and sees a certain. Uh, uh, vision of promise that has been presented about this country. Um, of course, you know, none of this is black and white, you know, you know, that dream may have been realized for a lot of people. I'm not saying that it's a total falsehood. Uh, I'm simply saying that it is a dream that while made accessible to some people was made a nightmare to other people or made totally inaccessible to other people. And so we should just be honest with ourselves about how different segments of the Muslim community relate to this national aspiration of what it means to be an American citizen and to pursue the quote unquote American dream. Um, so now you got me talking all abstractly. I got to wrap no, my that's head good. back no, around that, that's that's these, these are points that, you know, we maybe you've heard about like passing, but concretely it now it's making sense. Yeah, and I think a lot of time with this, I can speak on on behalf of the you know the Indians, Pakistanis, you know, the, from the subcontinent is um, when uh, our parents' generation had migrated here, they were very concerned with making sure everything that they traveled for, which was for monetary monetary reasons, that that would that would be kept intact, and if anything that affected that understanding of taking that whole if you want to say hijra they made, which was for monetary reasons or for education, they would make sure that they would just back off of it and not have any type of confrontation that could affect that. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because the ones who made it here made it, you know, and they couldn't show their faces of getting rejected and go back because of something political or even saying, speaking up and talking the truth about something or you know, they, they they didn't want that confrontation because it was going to affect that. It was that, a business transaction. It was a major business transaction. And also, would you but say they were thinking about their progeny, obviously. The right. intentions were awesome. And the beautiful thing that comes like, comes out of this, because we don't talk about this enough, is that my parents' generation had no idea that they were bringing Islam over here. You know, you can hear my parents' generation talk about that all the time, that they just came here for monetary reason, education, and... Through their children, that next generation, they became more religious and more aware of the deen, you know, and they never thought that you'd have, you go to a Muslim private school and like, you know, a fourth of the kids in each class are hufad of Quran, you know, and they were born and raised here. So it's, everything happens for a reason, you know. But wouldn't you say there's already Islam here with the indigenous community? It was here, but it wasn't really, it wasn't something, it wasn't really a force that everybody really knew about. Those individuals who had to research it, I think, found out about it, Right. I don't think we grew up 
being raised about, oh, you know what, the, the Native Americans that were tribes. I think uh, Abdul Hakim Quick is the first person I heard that about, heard that from, that there were some uh, uh, tribes here that were Muslim. You know, Islam had reached them. But that's... There, there, were, there were waves of Muslims that, have, that had come in the past, yeah. but they would assimilate into society very quick. Majority of uh, immigrants right back then were always thinking about the UK yeah, um, and those colonies that or former colonies. The comment you make about Im- assimilating, um, there's a player for the uh, Detroit Red Wings. I'm not really a hockey person. Justin Abdelkader. Yeah. Justin Abdelkader. Yeah. yeah. You know, and I think it, the story is that his maybe great-grandfather was a Lebanese immigrant. Right. Right, and the name went from Yusuf... Abdulkader to Joseph, and then just got wider Not and wider Abukader, over time. Abukader. Now it's yeah. Abdulkader. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I, I, I think there's, you know, to the point that Mahin made. There's, of course, that that like really uh, sort of a- more ancient history, right? There's the, uh, you know, there's the history of the the predecessor to Mansa Musa taking a caravan of 300 ships across the Atlantic and most likely landing in South America. And you see, you know, representations of like African uh, figures that, you know, the most logical history is the voyage that he made. And and then there's, you know, the history of folks who, uh, you know, may have interacted with early um, indigenous, uh, you know, first nations communities. Um, you know, all of that is there. Uh, but I think in terms of, in terms of that more modern history, in terms of 20th, 20th century Islam in America, um, you know, it's it's uh, it's it's incredibly complex, you know, and and I and I actually, you know, it's complex all the way up to this day, you know, in terms of what our priorities are in this country. Um, uh, you know, I didn't come into Islam until 2009. So I, so this was two years after the death oh, sure. of Imam Warthi Muhammad, Rahimullah. And this is, you know, this is eight years after 9-11. And I got, and I came into the community and immediately got really active with groups like the Inner City Muslim Action Network and others. And, um, you know, my wife is really active in different circles. And so I see from her exposure from her work to different elements of the community. And it's, it's sometimes really, um, it's, it's really, easy sometimes to be disappointed in the sort of in the state of our community in a lot of ways and i had to check myself recently and maybe it was at ikna i think i think it was listening to suhaib web at one point or something but he was reflecting on all of the things that all the positive things that the muslim community was doing in the mid and late 90s and and i had to sit back and say man you don't know islam in america prior to 2001 like personally me i don't know it and uh and 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 the like the rupturing effect that that date has had on this community and its priorities um, and even its geographic makeup is really stark. And, uh, and I say that to say that just like, there's, you know, the, the whole history, like there are some generalities you can draw ra- around, you know, who was the most prevalent representation of Islam prior to 1965, you know, but then again, what was, you know, what was they, their Akita, like, what were they really representing? Or, you know, there's all these, like, there's just so much richness, you know? Um, and even to like, you know, the way that the country's foreign policy has impacted the practice of Islam in this country beyond just who gets let in, but, but particularly like what representations of Islam get let in. So, you know, one of the sisters here who's local to this area, who, uh, sister Sa'ad, Dr. Sa'ad Abdul Kabir, who's an anthropology professor at Purdue, you know, she, I've seen her sort of reflect publicly about what the difference in the black American Muslim community would be had the U.S. had a different relationship with Iran as opposed to Saudi Arabia, right? And you've got like a burgeoning black Shia community today, but there's a real question of, you know, had the revolution not occurred and, and, and America kept the buddy, buddy relationship it had with Iran prior to that, would there have been other influences on Islam that permeated this country earlier that really changed the dynamics of what we look like? So there's just, there's so much nuance and and complexity to the makeup of the community today. And, and um, I'm just going to shift gears a little before we get to the dream uh, of Detroit program. Um, And, when I see brothers uh, from the black community uh, from my masjid, they they think some like we're kind of overreacting, 
you know, uh, uh, Muslims is like, what are you guys scared about? I mean, just because there's a politician coming in and he's he's talking about this. I mean, you guys, you guys are kind of overreacting, right? And so one of the brothers, he was telling me, if you guys saw what I saw on a daily basis in Chicago, you guys wouldn't be worried. And I can tell you that this is just something that there's nothing to be worried about, right? So, but for yourself, when, you, when you're Muslim and you're African-American, do you think that it's kind of like a different type of pressure? Because it's, you know, you, you, the whole political arena is focusing on Islam now, you know, and, uh, you know, d- d- does that does that kind of disturb you or... or or should I say, does it add more stress on now as far as Islam is concerned? Uh, I, you know, I don't think so. You know, I, that's a really interesting question. I, what I will say is that, like, uh, y'all do be overreacting. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's good. I think we need to hear that. You know, but, but I agree but with part you. of it is because, like, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of our suburban communities have, have, uh, have placed themselves near sites of violence. Right. Like the reality is that like, I mean, I live, I live in Detroit. Me and my wife live on the West side of Detroit. We live in the hood. Basically. We want it to be near a particular masjid. We wanted to do this community work in a place that we felt it was important to have the type of, uh, Dawa effort that, that the work presents itself or, or presents an opportunity to do. Um, but at the same time, like, you know, well, what, number one, what I'll say about our neighborhood is that it's more, it's more, it's more vacant than it is violent, such as the <laughs> story of a lot of Detroit areas these days. But you know, like, I don't, you know, I, I, I could walk laps throughout my neighborhood and never feel at at danger because of the kufi on my head or the beard on my face. Similarly, like my wife can go out in her hijab and her kamar and never feel threatened in our neighborhood. If you take her to Livonia, Michigan, she will feel threatened. Mm. Now, for some reason, a lot of Michigan Muslims have thought to make Livonia their home. Livonia is a, is a place that in my lifetime, we grew up not going to. Livonia was a sunset town. Black people don't come here after dark. Like, Livonia was, in the mid-2000s, still rated as the most racist city in America. Why brown Muslim communities have chosen places like that to set up shop totally baffles me. But then I'm not surprised when you say, hey, we're scared. Well, Because y'all are in a scary place. Y'all are in a place where they still proudly hang their Confederate flags. They don't do that in my hood, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, you know, you got a little bit more to it's be the importance about. of uh, sticking to the Jama'ah, basically, yeah, right? I don't know, man. Uh, sticking to the Jama'ah, and that's where you feel safe. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's different for everyone. You can't actually just say, like, oh, well, why, why, did, that, why did those people live in that rural town? Sometimes a masjid started from that initiative. Yeah, it depends. It's it's different for every person. I think every family, every man has to be the shepherd for his family and decide is if if that's a good decision for their family. Right. Yeah. Right. So, Dream of Detroit. What's that about? You talked talked a little bit about it. It's like a joint initiative between the Pakistani Muslim community and the African American Muslim community. Tell us more about it a little bit. Sure. Um, you know, and I'll just say, just to my last statement and to Brother Sim's statement, that you know, the, of course, you know, the reality, like, time changes everything. So, you know, uh, like it is, it is not as if the Muslim community in this in this city that I mentioned, for instance, hasn't had, you know, you know, an impact on that place over the last ten to fifteen years, right? It isn't as if the massages that they're building aren't changing the co- local cult- culture or their very presence. So. Uh, you know, like things change and, 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 you know, I know a lot of really beautiful Muslim communities located in places where I wouldn't, wouldn't be my first necessarily choice to, to build a home. But, uh, I'll give you an example. We have, a, a place called Wheaton, Illinois, uh-huh. and, uh, Wheaton, Illinois is known for the highest concentration of churches in America. Hmm. Literally there's a church on every block and, we had a. There's Wheaton College too, which is right. like evangelical. And right. Was it the college. driest? I think there were, at a time there was no alcohol liquor shops there too, right? Is this still My, that way? It yeah. may have been, um, okay. but it's also home to what's the known as the Harvard of Bible universities, uh, which is called Wheaton College. So we had a masjid that started up over there uh, called Islamic Center of Wheaton, and it was in the news a lot with um, a professor who had 
at Wheaton College had taken sides with or no, she, all she, she did was she was she donned a hijab. Yeah, no, or, no she donned a hijab. Yeah, but she said she drew the similarities between Islam and Christianity. Right. She said no. we worship the same God, basically. Yeah. That's what we yeah. said, right? Yeah, and then she had worn a hijab just yeah. out of support for Muslims, and she. It apparently caused a huge controversy at her college, right? Yeah, something so and a lot, a lot of uh, non-Muslims found out about this, and some were in support of her, some were were not in support of her. But, but what it happened was because the Islamic Center of Wheaton was there, it had initiated a lot of dialogue between yeah. the Christian community and the Muslim community, right? So things can happen, and th- when we're talking about, you know. When we're discussing ideas, we're not talking about absolutes. When we're saying sticking with the Jamaah, we're not saying in absolutely every single situation that is the the way forward. No, there there, there are situations where you have to, you know, get out of your comfort zone and you have to meet with other people. And a lot of times, with at least from my own experiences with non-Muslims, you're the way you if if you're going to be uncomfortable around them, they can see that, and they're going you're going to be treated like that. If you're going to feel like, hey, you're an American citizen and you're an, you're a Muslim also at the same time, but if you want to be, if you feel like you should be treated differently, you you will be treated differently. It's what I'm tr- really trying mm. to say, right? So That's very interesting, yeah. No, that's true. I think, you know, one of our frequent guests is Sheikh Hamza Mabul. And I remember I was having sushi with him once in downtown Elmhurst, Illinois, right? And this dude, everywhere he's go, he's got like a lungi on, a kurta, a turban. And a shawl over his shoulder. He's a big dude too. Yeah, but he just walks around like a boss, like he don't care. Yeah, yeah. You know, so if you like what Sim was saying, well, Sheikh Hamza also <laughs> he a... he does not look like someone you want to mess with. <laughs> <laughs> Mashallah. So, anyways, back to Dream of Detroit before we digress too much. <laughs> yeah. So you know, Dream is um, you know an aspiring. Uh, community-based organization and community development corporation. So what we often say is that we're combining community organizing with uh, strategic housing and land development to rebuild our neighborhood on the west side of Detroit. Beautiful. And um, we're located in a, in a neighborhood that has uh, seen particularly high disinvestment over the years. Um, it's an area where it, it's lost so many people that a lot of the urban planners who come and look at Detroit don't uh, don't really foresee it rebounding in terms of population. Um, and so it is, you know, it's what we call a, it's what Homer Simpson would call a crisis it, 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 <laughs> it is our crisis and our opportunity all in one, right? It's our gift and our curse. So it's an area where, uh, you know, certainly there are no other developers rushing in that are going to chase a, a little bootstrap project like ours out. Um, before you decided on this initiative, how did you, come up with well at least i would have thought hey is detroit even being saved because usually being a rescue of a city involves corporations and a lot of uh, investments happening within the within the city did you see any of this trend that made you say hey you know what the city can be saved but well you know i think whether the city you know, I, I don't love that framing, like whether the city rebounds is really contingent on the people who live in the city and uh, and making um, those city, those people and their elected officials finding the resources to bring back our neighborhoods. So when we looked at and, and I'm, I moved back to Detroit in 2013 and got involved with this project pretty much right away, it had just started in the year prior to that, um, we pulled back and, and we did. We looked at the investments that were being made in downtown, particularly by the business community. We looked at neighborhoods that were being um, uh, uh, really um, where control was sort of being taken and and development was being guided by the artist community. We look at a lot of pockets throughout the city, um, usually on the sort of borders of the city that are being, um, that are getting a large influx of Muslim immigrants uh, from Yemen, from Senegal and Gambia and, um, uh, Bosnia. So there are a lot of, really, when you look at the city of Detroit itself, anywhere, any particular area where there's sort of concentrated growth, it's it's almost entirely anchored by Muslim communities right now. Hmm. Um, our project just happens to be 
the one that is least connected to the first generation immigrant experience in the sense that like uh you know it, it's not it's not your you it's not your sort of typical immigrant enclave where folks just happen to be muslim it's generally people who um you know uh, have several generations of family history here who've come together to deliberately work on this particular neighborhood so you know our area is one that um you know, we sort of we sit at an area in the city that we think is accessible to to other local sort of Muslim sort of hot spots in Detroit. So, if you're familiar with Canton, Michigan, you know you can get to Canton from where we are in 20 minutes. You can get to Farmington Hills and the Tawhid Center and that community in 15 to 20 minutes. You can get to Hamtramck, large uh, Bosnian community, Bengali community, in five minutes. So it's a place that's accessible to other pockets of Muslim activity. It's also a place that has a lot of land available and a lot of vacant homes that can be purchased and rehabbed um, or demolished and built anew. So um, what we're trying to do is basically threefold. We want to, uh, number one, around this particular mosque, which is really the biggest one sort of in Detroit proper, we want to build a thriving community living around it. It's a it's a masjid that has a 30-year history, but has um, in a lot of ways been a commuter masjid over those 30 years. And so uh, part of what we're trying to do is is um, sort of shift the priority of the community to sort of living within proximity of the masjid. Uh, the second layer is that, um, you know, we think that uh, the Muslim community, as well as every other sort of sub-community in the Detroit area, uh, deserves its opportunity to contribute to the future of the city. And so if the city is going to come back and if it's going to happen through a patchwork of localized communities creating what they want to see as the future of the city, well, then what is the avenue for Detroit's Muslim community, which is 100 years old, to also have an avenue to contribute to the city's comeback? And so that's what we want to position DREAM as. Um, and in doing that, we think we can build a thriving urban Muslim community in this neighborhood that can actually be a beacon for the rest of the city Mashallah. and the rest of the States. I mean, rest of the United States, Mashallah man. Mashallah. Yeah. That's... You know, so, and then the third piece, you know, going back to the, you know, earlier comment about the relationship between the Pakistani and the black Muslim community is that, you know, I'll say in my perspective, so the neighborhood that we're in is 92% black. That's not abnormal for the city of Detroit. But in that neighborhood, that's the case. First of all, practically speaking, a project like ours is really only going to be successful realistically if the black Muslim community embraces it. So whereas we've leveraged resources across these different ethnic groups and we get a lot of volunteers from all throughout the region come out and help. And a lot of folks are just generally excited about what we're trying to do. Like we actually need residents <laughs> that, that like we need people to make that long. commitment to come move into this neighborhood. And we know that practically speaking, the first, maybe the only, but certainly the first people who are going to do that are going to be members of the black Muslim community. We also know that like from a, from the perspective of who is best equipped to give dawah to this 92% black area, it's more than likely the black Muslim community. And we're not, I'm not saying exclusively, but when you talk about the cultural parallels that matter when it comes to dawah, like it makes sense that like that what we're trying to build is, is going to be anchored in that experience. But the piece of it that's important to me, and this goes back to the, to the story of, like I said, of me taking my shahada at the hands of a Pakistani brother who had an anti-racist analysis and grew up around black people and was this sort of bridge between the black community and Muslim community on our campus. Oh. The, you know, and my, from my perspective, if, if we can't have like, like you hear people sometimes talk about like a sister masjid program, like, Oh, right. Like the, you know, beautiful masjid a out in wherever has, you know, a sister brother relationship with the masjid in the hood. And, you know, sometimes people come from the hood and go out to the suburbs. And sometimes we go pass out food at the masjid in the hood. And it's this, be I don't really like, to me, that's shallow. Like, you know, the, the, like, it doesn't seem grassroots. Well, it doesn't seem very that. foundational. It's, it, it's not foundational. And it's this sort of like, it's this, it's, it's a very tenuous bridge that you're building between communities that are otherwise not connected. Mm. And, and, and my, from my perspective, like, 
you know, I come from a tradition, I come from a religious tradition where the, where the, the, the sacred text itself was manipulated to justify something like the shadow slavery of black people in this country. When I was coming to Islam, one of the things that appealed to me is that you could never look at the Quran or the words of the Prophet ﷺ and manipulate them to try to justify the atrocities that the Bible was was manipulated to justify. And so when you look at the state of our community today, it is uh, the, the, the separation between us is that like it, it is... We, we are a clear victim of white supremacy in the sense of how we've allowed dominant culture to separate us, uh, to separate us acro- like by ethnic lines within the broader Muslim community. And so when we talk about the dream project and the community that we're trying to build, you know, we talk about it being values based. And one of those values is something that is explicitly anti-racist. And, and what that means is that attack, attacking the racism that pervades the Muslim community should allow us to actually build a, a community of folks living together and real mm-hmm. beloved community. I, I think the uh, the the concept of the sister masjid in the suburbs, for instance, and the the original masjid in the inner city, and having that connection of in Ramadan or outside Ramadan, the reason I think where that may seem a little superficial is because that's not really solving a problem, and it's 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 just patchwork for dilemmas. But when we go back to sleep, we're all safe. You know, they're Everyone's facing their problems the next day, right? Until we meet again to alleviate those problems, I guess, through our through our relationship. But the project that you're doing is something very grassroots, something very foundational, and it's actually solving a problem, right? And when I when I read this on the website, and you, I remember it saying, in short, our goal is to build dense, thriving community on the west side of Detroit based on prophetic values of compassion and living and concern for one's neighbor, right? And I I think it's very inevitable that when somebody talks, uh, you know, about building a community, we automatically think of Rasulullah in his hijrah, right? And uh, we see that in that hijrah of Rasulullah that Aisha, radiallahu an, you know, she was referring to a battle that happened before you know, it may have been even before uh, the Rasulullah's prophethood, yeah, of a battle called the Battle of Ba'ath, right? And Aisha radiallahu anh, she said that this battle was the best thing that could have happened because there were, and I'm going to tie this all in. She said that all of the heads of the chiefs of Medina had died and they were looking for someone of leadership, right? And what better leader would be or who would be better than Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi So they were actually waiting for somebody, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, again, creates these things for the believers to see of how they manifest into something, right? And when you're talking about building a community, and the reason why I asked you in the beginning of why you wanted to be a mayor, see, these are thoughts of somebody who wants to take initiative in their hands and be a leader, not because they love leadership, is because they stomach the responsibility and they need change has to occur from a grassroots level, not just patchwork, right? So whether it's coming into the fold of Islam and all these different things and then the Pakistani community with the African-American community, these things are all something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala paves for us, right? And you're a part of that. And, and you know, I think the dream of Detroit is a very, very relevant name for that, is because there's somebody who wants to build something on the values of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and of compassion and of, you know, uh, uh, the neighbor himself, that even Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he, he mentioned that there was, it's as if the rights of the neighbors are so much that they were going to be inheriting from from the neighbor, right? So uh, uh, there's so many parallels that can be drawn with this. And I think the work that you're doing is a very prophetic type work in the sense that you go somewhere, you see a dilemma, and you need to see change. You're not going to just think about change. You want that change to occur. Mark, a final question. Um, One of the challenges that I heard from a lot of community organizers and people who work well with places that need a a lot of support is that they, they say that people need to want change in their communities that they're working with. And that that's one of the challenges that a lot of people have gotten accustomed to their life. However miserable it is to us, they've gotten used to it. And 
their challenge as a community organizer is that, hey, don't get used to this. Break out of it. That's yeah, deep. You know? Yeah, that's deep. Yeah. So, is that one of your challenges also? Where, where you're kind of saying, like, hey, stop accepting the status quo. This is not the way everyone else in America is living. They're, they don't have this. Um, they're not living under fear of their security, their livelihood, it's just basic rights. Yeah. Just basic rights as a human being, yeah. Just a couple layers to that. The the number one in a city like in a place like ours, there's um you know, you've you, Detroit is unfortunately, particularly, you know, coming out of the Great Depression, the late 2000s, there was a real breakdown in the delivery of city services. So, you know, you can't, it's hard to expect a, full, a people, a group of people, a community, a city to overnight go from having certain sets of basic services delivered to them and handled, handled by their elected government for 50, 60 years to all of a sudden having to do those things themselves. Right. Um, you know, or to see like the industry that undergirds an entire region be decimated so quickly that, like that basic services that people were used to paying for or being able to pay for it, they just aren't anymore. So, you know, there is a lot of, um, you know, there's some, there's some trauma there to overcome. And then there's, uh, I mean, it's, it's, you should remember the water crisis, right? Mm -hmm. In uh, Flint and people were still, you know, apprehensive about the water when, Anywhere else in the country, no one would have had, you know, would have, no one would have thought twice, okay, well, the government says it, it's clear, it's all clear, and they would drink it, right? But this city has been betrayed by, you know, so many establishments around them that, that they don't have that confidence anymore, but they're ending up, well, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to drink that water anyway, whereas any other city in, in the country would have been given every guarantee, every assurance that there would have been politicians drinking that water, making sure that, hey, <laughs> you know what? I'll Displaying the drinking. Yeah, you know, making sure that, that the people are are not worried at all. But it just seems like like the, the psychology is kind of broken, right? You know, our, our governor did stand up there and drink some of the water. Yeah. The, the thing is, he's not a two-year-old susceptible to lead poisoning. You know? <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> That's the issue. Mm. But, you know, just, just to wrap up on your other point, you know, uh, I think like most community efforts, people um, people get most excited once they see a little bit of process, progress, right? So no matter how f complete and, and hopeful and optimistic and necessary we may have thought our vision was when we first rolled it out as a part of this project, like, people weren't going to actually get involved until they saw House 1 get done and right. then House 2 get done and then House 3, you know. And so alhamdulillah, over the years, we've seen the support for the project grow We've seen people start to say, oh, man, this this might really happen this time. We, we might really, you know, and, and Allahu Alam, it, 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 may, it still may or may not. You know, we're certainly committed to it. You know, my wife and I and our kids moved into the neighborhood earlier this year. And, you know, we're looking for neighbors quite actively right now. And, um, you know, and there are some other big developments, alhamdulillah, that are sort of coming down the pipeline for us. So we think that there's a ton of, pro you know, promise here. But, uh you know, we also know that you have to be patient with trying to gain community support for something like this. And that we're asking people to make, you know, a rather large investment, certainly people who are asking to move into the neighborhood. I mean, it's not a, that's not a light ask. And we know that, um, you know, but also, you know, just talk about the neighbors around us, folks who've been in that community for decades, you know, you know the older families who didn't lose their homes in the recession and decided that they weren't gone anywhere and still keep their beautiful yards. And, you got younger folks who are now in mainly a renter's economy and are sort of in and out, but they find themselves in our neighborhood right now. And all of them are grateful to see what the Muslims have done so far. You know, we planted 114 trees in our neighborhood last year, wow. had 200 volunteers come out to do that. And we boarded up 25 vacant homes. Um, you know, we've filled countless 30 yard, you know, dumpsters full of debris that we've cleaned up, you know, from vacant homes and lots and just off the streets. And, you know, the neighbors are noticing and they're grateful. And one of the things that we've been very keen to, t to say to them and to the community, the Muslim community itself, is that, you know, yes, we're talking about moving a lot of Muslims into this neighborhood, 
but we're also talking we're, we're not talking about some sort of hostile takeover <laughs> you know i'm not talking <laughs> about moving miss west and miss jackson out of their homes you know if anything i'm talking about helping them cut down the overgrown tree in their backyard that no one Wish else will yeah. you know so it's uh you know there's a lot of deliberate work here to involve you know more and more people in the muslim community and to really cast a wide enough net so that we can get the density that we need um, but also to to make the neighbors who are there and who've held down that community for decades continue to feel welcome in their own homes and in their own neighborhood. Absolutely. So, Mark, uh, as we wrap up, where can people find out more about Dream? And if they want to like even support you guys financially, how can they do so? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, I definitely um, encourage folks to visit dreamofdetroit.org. You know, that's just D-R-E-A-M-O-F, Detroit.org. Um, there you can sort of get a glimpse of our whole vision for the, for the neighborhood, you know, for what we plan to do with the residential properties, you know, ideas for what we might do with the commercial properties. Um, and then you can also, you know, if you feel inclined, you can contribute, you know, we are a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, you know, we're totally a volunteer led organization right now. This is not my nine to five. Um, I don't really have a nine to five per se, but this is not my, my, my first job. Um, but it's a labor of love for a lot of us who see the promise in it. So, um, you know, this podcast. So anyone in Michigan who might be hearing this can certainly sign up to volunteer. Anyone from around the country who might be hearing this and interested in how to help, you know, donations are always welcome. Um, there's a big contribute link right on our homepage, or you can just go straight to Det- dreamofdetroit.org slash contribute. Um, and any gift, you know, is appreciated and all your odds are appreciated. Um, and, you know, please just, you know, remember this project and its success and the success of the people who are affiliated with it in your prayers. And we would be very grateful for that. Absolutely. MashaAllah, may Allah continue to bless you guys and I mean, make this project a success. And it already sounds like it's being a success. Alhamdulillah. So JazakAllah Khair for coming on. Oh, yeah. I, you know, um, you know, for our listeners out there, if you have any comments or questions, you can email us at the themadmamluks at gmail.com. That's T-H-E-M-A-D-M-A-M-L-U-K-S. Uh, real quick for our Chicago listeners, uh, for Dream of Detroit, you guys go out to Dearborn for your Shatila and <laughs> Yasmin Bakery and all the other stuff. Famous Burger, stop by and see these, see what they're doing there. Inshallah, it's not too. Inshallah. My wife and I had an opportunity uh, when was it Harun's Akika, right? Uh-huh. It's the weekend. We had a chance to check out the masjid in the neighborhood. Alhamdulillah, y'all were doing some great work. Alhamdulillah. Um, so back to as far as Mamluks go, you know, we can follow us on Twitter uh, at the Mad Mamluks. Face, like our Facebook page. Please rate us five stars on iTunes. Uh, we don't ask for a whole lot, but we ask for your continued support. Let your friends know about it if you enjoy the podcast. We are live on in 40 out of 50 states. So spread the word. Make it 50. Yeah, make it 50. Well, <laughs> there's some states that we don't want to be active in. Yeah. <laughs> There'll be some people coming out looking for us. <laughs> right. So with that being said, for our special guest, Mark Crane, Sheikh Amr Saeed, Sim, I'm Mahin. For the Mad Mum Looks, signing off. Assalamu alaikum.